It's officially game on in the presidential campaign. That's after the Republican National Convention wrapped up Thursday to set the stage for the rest of the campaign. Republicans put their stamp on the pandemic version of the National Convention. There was fanfare and fireworks, a lot of pre-produced speeches like we saw from the Democrats. They featured harsh criticism of Joe Biden. The Democrats did the same to Donald Trump. One thing the Republicans had for their biggest speakers, crowds. First Lady Melania Trump spoke in front of a crowd at the White House Rose Garden. Vice President Mike Pence at Fort McHenry and President Donald Trump in front of about 1,500 people on the south lawn of the White House. Big breaks in tradition with ethics questioned by the use of federal property for political purposes. Nevertheless, Donald Trump made his case asking Americans to send him back to the White House for another four years by repeatedly jabbing the Democrats. Together we have ended the rule of the failed political class and they are desperate to get their power back by any means necessary. You've seen that. They are angry at me because instead of putting them first, I very simply said America first. Donald Trump now hopes to build some momentum and get a bump in the polls from the convention. Republicans put their own twist on the event under the restrictions of the pandemic, and we saw some similarities and differences compared to the Democrats. We'll talk about that this morning with Scott County Democratic Party Chair Alicia Gaiman and the Republican Chair for the Illinois 17th Congressional District, as well as Henry County's Republican Party Chair Jan Weber. Great to have you both on the program. Good morning. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Donald Trump played a very active role in the convention, making more than the usual one public address. Overall, Republicans delivered a stark message, kind of like the Democrats did, only this was an anti-Joe Biden message sprinkled with some optimism. Both parties call it the most important election in the country's history. I guess, how well did the Republicans deliver their message, and how much are the undecided voters both parties are trying to reach really paying attention to make much of a difference? Jan, you're the Republican. We'll let you start. Well, I think people are feeling energized. Um, we're seeing the numbers, at least that some of the media reports show, that a lot more people have been tuning in the last three nights. Tonight is the big night for President Trump. Um, I think going through the pandemic we've lived in since March, um, people are eager for positive upbeating and um, a direction of where our country's headed. So I think they've uh, so far done a good job at getting that energy out there. And uh, I'll say this, our calls to our headquarters for Trump signs is going through the roof. So that's a good sign in my opinion. And we are talking, yes, on uh, Thursday before the president delivers his address. Alicia, both parties have tried to make the most of the pandemic and deliver some sort of high level production. What do you take of the Republicans delivery? Um, you know, I I was hoping for the optimism and positivity that <laughs> that we were promised going into it, um, but we definitely haven't seen a whole lot of that. Um, and I think you know people are tired, and quite frankly, in Iowa, I can speak for um, you know we, we're dealing with the the storm cleanup, the derancho, the you know week long delay in getting presidential declarations of disaster, and then when we got it, only one county. So I think people between that and the the coronavirus pandemic, we are incredibly tired and we're incredibly ready for some change in November. So we've seen both parties put a lot of emphasis on style over substance, at least in the televised portions of the conventions. One criticism our Republican panelists had last week about the Democratic convention is that they didn't talk much about policy. Well, earlier in the week they did adopt a platform. The Republicans actually overtly went out of the way to not adopt a platform this year. How was that expected to play with voters? What does it say about the Republican Party? Alicia? Well, you know, I, I definitely stand by our Democratic Party platform, and I think it adds transparency to elections and to candidates. Um, and I think it's a very important part of the process, and it's, you know, a very uh, ground-up thing um, to develop that platform from the night of caucus we're, we're doing resolutions all the way up to the state convention and national convention so i really uh i i don't know um you know it's kind of unprecedented not to have a platform on a party and especially for a national ticket so only the voters will be able to determine you know what that means to them in november jen what is it uh, about not having a platform this year what do you think that says what is the message that voters should take away from that well, I think we still do have a platform. The resolution adopted in Charlotte on Monday, um, I don't believe it was aired by a lot of the media, was that we will continue with the platform of 2016, that we're strong on the sanctity of life, uh, education, um, for support of our military, um, you know, 
terrorism. So really nothing uh, has changed. Uh, it was just that the Republicans realized early on that there would not be the opportunity to have the full slate of delegates in Charlotte. I was elected as a delegate. I, I'd hoped that today I would be in Charlotte, North Carolina, or Jacksonville, Florida, or someplace participating in this uh, process. But needless to say, uh, wiser heads prevailed that due to COVID, it wasn't safe for our large gatherings together. And I'm abiding by that, as I hope everyone is. But um, so our platform is still there. I think in the coming weeks, you'll see a lot more that will come out from our local party organizations and our state party organizations reaffirming those platform issues that. Uh, have been the battle mark of the Republican Party for decades. What about the use of Mike Pompeo speaking from Israel? It's rare to actually, some can say it's unprecedented that uh, a foreign diplomat really is uh, appearing at a political convention. What do you think about that, Jan? What do you say to those critics? Well, I think it shows the importance that uh, President Trump and the Republican Party put on a strong relationship with the people of Israel. Uh, that's where he is um, on his travels right now. And, uh, you know, he is a was chosen by the president for that office. So uh, I, I think it was um, it, it set a, a huge mark and it, it lets the people uh, of Israel know and, and people in the United States that um, the United States will be behind Israel as they move forward and continue their process of, of rebuilding and regrowing and um, becoming, you know, what they want to be in Israel. Alicia, what do you make of Pompeo's appearance? Um, well, I think we've got enough Rock Island Arsenal employees <laughs> here in our area to really kind of determine uh, the, the violations that we saw run rampant in the last few nights on the convention. But, you know, it's it's sad that the taxpayer dollars have to be going to funding um, a campaign. This is a total blatant violation of the Hatch Act. And, and you know, if we want to have publicly financed com campaigns, let's have that conversation. But a national convention, um, when one party is doing it and the other is not, um, is not hardly a, a level playing field. Mike Pence spoke Wednesday night with Fort McHenry as his backshop, the vice president, the man in charge of the pandemic response for the Trump administration, defended the president's strategy for COVID-19. Pence also promoted his boss as a man for law and order to, to, among other things, manage those demonstrations coming out of the Black Lives Matter movement. In these challenging times, our country needs a president who believes in America, who believes in the boundless capacity of the American people to meet any challenge, defeat any foe, and defend the freedoms we hold dear. America needs four more years of President Donald Trump in the White House. There's no denying this president is a very polarizing figure. We've seen a lot of turnover in his administration. I don't know if you can make the argument of anyone more loyal to the president than Vice President Mike Pence outside of the president's family. And Pence demonstrated it once again in his speech Wednesday night. And uh, in fact, he presented Donald Trump as the law and order president. How important is he to the president and to the Republican Party for a post-Trump administration? Jan? I think Vice President Pence is a very vital part of the president's team. Uh, we look at... Uh, the leadership that he brought forward in helping the president uh, when the COVID situation first developed. Uh, he's articulate. Uh, he's closely connected to the military. His son is in the military. His son-in-law is in the military. Uh, and I think he has his ear to the ground, so to speak, of what's going on uh, on a more day-to-day -day basis because of his ability to be able to travel a little more and, and meet more freely with people. Uh, so I think Vice President Pence was, was right on with his comments last night. Um, and I, I think he's, uh, he's one of the key elements of the part of, of that makes that a strong team at the White House uh, with Vice President Pence to support President Trump in his endeavors. Alicia, it is hard to argue that Mike Pence has certainly been very loyal to this president. Yeah, I definitely would not disagree with that. Um, I do I do think it is as much of an advantage for the president, a disadvantage for a lot of the voters, though. Um, you know, seeing him fail to lead on COVID, seeing, you know, fail to move the administration into a, an area where we have a comprehensive plan for this pandemic that we're in, um, you know, it's really disheartening that he is kind of such a, you know, a yes man to the president. Um, I think voters like to see him adding something. He just seems kind of like the president's shadow a lot of times, and you don't really get a sense of where he's at on issues that he's passionate about on his own. And I think that would be something the voters would like to, to know. But is that the, the vice president's role? Is he supposed to be a supportive figure? 
Alicia? Well, I think definitely should complement, in my opinion, I think the vice president should complement the president's weaknesses. Um, we really just haven't seen Pence come out of the shadow of Trump, though. Um, and I think that's that's where the voters are going to be questioning whether or not, um, you know, he's, he's going to be a good vice president. There are more aspects of the Republican convention to cover with our panel coming up. Iowa twice. A couple of heavy hitters from the Hawkeye State endorsed the president. What influence they can have on a group the president carried four years ago. For the record.